Saturday night, and you're getting ready to go to Dundee to see a friend in the morning, when on the radio news you hear the deadly Glasgola virus that decimates 50% of every community that it affects has hit South Glasgow. You're in the north and you know that if you get out now, you could be in Dundee in less than two hours. It's a no-brainer. But then the radio says, Glaswegians must not travel. You think, am I already infected? Should I stay? Should I get out? You don't know, but you have to decide. This is what Catherine Bishop from the University of Oxford calls a wicked problem. Something with multiple components that you've never encountered before. So before I go back to your own dilemma, I want to tell you a little bit about my own experience over the years and how my attitude has changed to wicked problems. When I was a little girl, I was extremely strong-minded. And I once asked my mum a question that I kind of knew the answer to, I thought. I said, Mum, what's a peer? And she said, that's somebody of your own age and stage. And I said, you're talking rubbish. A peer is an old guy with grey hair who tells you what to do. And I argued so strongly that eventually she just said, believe what you like. Well, of course, I was a little bit right that day. A peer back then, well, there were plenty of guys like that in the House of Lords. But of course, it was years before I was embarrassed to discover just how right she was, and that my stubbornness had prevented me learning anything new that day. Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that will cause you problems. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. I'm now a scientist, and science is full of situations where you think you know for sure, but actually it just ain't so. And I'm just a little bit less stubborn these days. I want to give you an example. Imagine you had done a survey of the people of Glasgow and you discovered that people who sing karaoke more than three times a week are at increased risk of liver disease. Well, obviously, that's a remarkable finding. So you send your findings off to The Lancet and then they come back just a few days later, with a letter from the editor saying, mm -mm, you didn't take into account other possible explanations. And you think, oh, of course they have a point. Karaoke goes better with a drink. And we know that alcohol is one of the primary causes of liver disease. So, in science, we would call alcohol a confounder. And in science, that's something that's linked to both of the things that you think are linked in your study. But there's a more ordinary dictionary definition of a confounder, and that's something unexpected that can prove you wrong. So the other thing that the editor of The Lancet says to you is, if you really want to demonstrate that reducing karaoke singing in Glasgow can reduce liver disease, you need to do a randomized controlled trial. So imagine we'd done that this morning. I would imagine that when you came in this morning, many of you were sitting with people that you know, your colleagues, talking about things that you have in common. If we instead had done a randomized control trial where I'd been standing at the, at the door and at the toss of a coin, I allocate you randomly to that side or that side of the auditorium. Your groups would be evenly spread across either side, a bit like stirring the lumps into pancake batter. And that's the beauty of a randomized control trial. It balances all the confounders across both groups so that actually you would have the same number of heavy drinkers and you would also have the same risk of liver disease in both groups. So if we then introduced karaoke reduction therapy just into this side of the auditorium, we'd, we could prove whether it worked or not because everything else would be equal. I'll leave you to think about that. But the other thing about a randomized controlled trial is it's only ethical to do it if you really don't know the answer. Many children who have cancer these days are entered into randomized controlled trials. And imagine you were a parent of a child with cancer, sick child with cancer. You'd be thinking, I'm not going to enter my child into a game of chance. But other parents on the ward might be saying to you, 
we've seen children do well in randomised controlled trials. It's a wicked problem. You don't know, but you have to decide. So you talk to the doctors and they tell you that in the trial, they're comparing the best known treatment of cancer with something that might even be a little bit better. But they don't know. So that your child has the same chance of survival in either arm of the trial, and you're relying on the doctors not knowing the answer. So what's this got to do with leadership? Well, imagine if your boss gave you a wicked problem. Imagine your boss said, our, com our company's losing money. You're almost certainly going to have to make your team redundant unless they can win a highly competitive contract. That's a, that's a tough problem for you. You don't know what to do, but you have to decide who to tell. Do you keep that to yourself? That night, you can't sleep. You're up at four o'clock in the morning. You're, you're composing a difficult email to those team members to warn them about the high chance of, of redundancy. And then you think, but if I do that, how are they ever going to win the bid? And then self-doubt starts to creep in and you think, surely if I'm a leader, I should be able to make this decision. But you sleep on it. And then in the morning, two of your most trusted team members are there in the coffee room, and you spill the beans, you say, guys, there's a high chance that you're gonna be made redundant. And then they tell you of the confounder, that unexpected thing that proves you wrong. Yesterday, they had had a phone call giving them the heads up that your team was actually the favorite to, to win the bid. The chance of redundancy is actually really very low. Thank goodness you didn't demotivate the team by pressing send on that email. So the team works really well, they're galvanized, they win the bid. You were a good leader. You shared the burden of the problem and your team told you of confounders that, that you couldn't have guessed at. That was time well spent. But what if you don't have time? What if it's a crisis situation? What do you do with wicked problems then? Well, one of our greatest leaders and decision makers was, is Chesley Sullenberger. Some of you may, may know him as Sully, who famously landed his Airbus A320 on the surface of the Hudson. Imagine the scene. It's a clear afternoon as they take off from LaGuardia Airport. Less than a minute after takeoff, they hit a flock of Canada geese that take out both engines, leaving the plane without power. There's a rapid interchange between Sully and air traffic control to no avail. They can't get back to any airport. Throughout this, the advanced ground proximity warning system is bleating. Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. Terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up. 17 seconds before hitting the surface of the Hudson and no doubt imagining almost certain death for himself and the 155 souls under his care. Chesley Sullenberger said to his first officer, got any ideas? I would argue that sharing the burden of the problem helped him make a perfect water landing that day. So back to your own dilemma. There you are in North Glasgow. You know you've got a 50-50 chance of dying if you stay. But if you're already infected, you should stay and die with the nearest and dearest. But if you're free of the virus, get out. But what if there's a carrier state? What if you could infect your friend in Dundee? What if you could infect the whole of Dundee? You don't know, but you have to decide. Well, remember that Mark Twain said, it ain't what you don't know that will cause you problems. I would argue, pick up the phone, speak to your loved ones and say, got any ideas? Thank you. <laughs>